Good morning, church. Uh, it's a new day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice. I know it's cold, but bear with me. I will try to be as fast as I can so that we can get back home and probably turn on our heaters and feel warm. Uh, before I begin, let me take this opportunity, first of all, to just uh, uh, wish all the fathers a happy Father's Day, and to all men, even as we look forward to leading our families and our homes, our prayers that the Lord will use this man at RBC to honor God, but also to uh, raise uh, godly children and to honor him even in so doing. And so happy Father's Day, even as you celebrate today. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We continue rejoicing in the goodness of the Lord, even as we are praising. So I'll read and then we, I'll pray and then we can begin from there. Ephesians chapter 2, if you're there, I'll read from uh, verses 1 all the way to verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1, the Bible says, And you are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body uh, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up uh, with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might know the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we are thankful that this morning, even as we look into your word, we are thankful that you are a great God. We are thankful that, Lord, as your word will admonish us this day, that you have raised us from our deadness and that now we are alive in Christ. And so even so, Lord, we rejoice in your doing and therefore we praise your name. We pray this morning, even as we uh, look into this word, that, Lord, you would encourage us. Pray for myself as I bring your word, that, Father, you would uh, speak to me even as you speak to those that are hearing this morning. We want to pray for your grace upon us, even as we face this season uh, where many are sickling. Lord, we pray that you will grant them grace. We pray that, Lord, they may know healing that comes from above. We want to pray with our sister churches, and especially with uh, uh, Thicker Road Baptist Church. We thank you for the life of Pastor Giagiri. And even as uh, other sister churches gather this afternoon to just celebrate his life as they do a memorial service on Friday and as they travel to Muranga on Saturday, we pray that, Lord, you will minister to them. Pray for comfort for the Kiagiris. We pray for comfort for the church. We pray, Lord, even for the transition uh, uh, from the leadership, even as they work on the details. We pray that, Lord, you will grant this brethren grace. And even us here, as we continue to look to you, especially for our meeting place, we ask that, Lord, you lead us as a church, that, Lord, you'll provide for us, that, Lord, you will grant us grace. We thank you for this property, that we have had an alternative meeting place, even as we wait on you, as we continue with other conversations. Lord, we pray that you will continue to guide us as a church. And, Lord, be with us this morning, even as we listen to your word. Speak to us. Uh, guide us, for this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we turn our attention to Ephesians chapter 2, we 
last week Philo concluded for us chapter 1 and we have been instructed to be reminded of the goodness of God. And this morning what I want us to do is just introduce chapter 2 and then in two weeks time we will continue uh, with uh, the study of Ephesians chapter 2. But notice as we read, uh, let me read and then I will, I will give my introduction even as we, we continue. Verse 2 to verse 5, so verse chapter 1, uh, chapter 2 verse 1 to 5 says, And you are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the tre in, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Well, as I stop there, you can notice that that is not the end of that sentence. It goes all the way to verses 10. But this morning, I want to focus basically on the first five verses, and then a brother will lead us through the rest uh, when he comes. But notice, Paul in chapter 2 wants us to notice first that before we knew Christ, before Christ uh, saved us, we were dead. And so what we see here is that he is reminding us of our past uh, status before Christ. And then in the middle, before he transitioned to tell us who we have become in Christ, he reminds us of who God is. And then finally, uh, he tells us of what we are after receiving the grace of God. And therefore, I've entitled this message, Behold the Grace of God. In other words, he has just walked us to appreciate what Paul is telling us is that we need to look back from context. What has he said in chapter 1 that warrants what he is about to tell us in chapter 2? And what we are seeing here is that Paul gives us a contrast between our former status and the status to which Christ has given us, what, the life that we have attained in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, verse 3, Paul began by telling us that believers in general, but specifically believers uh, in, at Ephesus, have a reason to praise God. He reminds us that we need to praise God because the Lord has blessed us with all spiritual blessings that are there in Christ Jesus. Secondly, in chapter, verses 4 of chapter 1, he reminds us that God chose us to be holy and to be blameless before him. And then he goes on in verses 5, he tells us, then continued, he continues therefore to unpack to us the reality of the choosing to which God has chosen us. He mentions that this choosing was for the purpose of God's will, so that the Lord might adapt us as his sons. Secondly, he reminds us that this adoption could only be true if we were redeemed and fully forgiven of our trespasses. One of the passages that I will read here reminds us in Psalms that as far as the east is to the west, the Lord has forgiven us, the Lord has cleared, the Lord has taken away all our transgressions, and therefore we can rejoice in his goodness. He continues to remind us in chapter 1 from verses 11 to verse 14, the goal for which God chose us, the goal for which God has saved us, is to unite us to Christ and to grant the saints a reason for an inheritance that awaits us. And then he continues to tell us uh, the last two Sundays, Philo has done a good job in just bringing this to our hearing to remind us that because of what God has done, believers must be grateful for the faith that the Lord has given them. And so Paul is grateful because of this saints' uh, faith that they are not only uh, faithful, their faith has been proven by the way they live their lives, by the way they love one another. And then he continues to remind us that as we do so, he prays that God will grant the saints spiritual insight uh, to know God and to comprehend his power 
in resurrecting Christ. And then he says, this power that God has demonstrated in resurrecting Christ gives us or demonstrates to us the victory that believers have over sin. This power now is the one that the Lord uses to raise uh, his people to, from a realm of being spiritually dead to uh, an exaltation of where we now stand with Christ as exalted, as alive, as people who are holy and as people whom the Lord has redeemed. So that's the context in which Paul brings us before he begins chapter one, chapter two, rather. But in chapter two, he kind of come to be who he is. Paul is always hard when it comes to the issue of sin. And so he's called us to praise God. He's told us why we need to praise God. Now he's coming back to remind us where God has taken us to where we now are. And so uh, let's, let's look at this and see how the Lord will instruct us even as we continue to praise his name for his goodness. Notice, because of what God has done in saving us, believers are therefore called to behold the wondrous grace of God. If this is to make sense in us, we must first of all realize who we were before our salvation so that we can fully have a grasp, so that we can fully know how to praise God knowing our present status in him. So look with me then, uh, verse 1 to 3, our former status. Verse 1 to 3 says, And we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom, when, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Notice then, what Paul does in this portion is he reminds us our status before Christ. Notice the reality of our status. We were spiritually dead. Now, I want to launch this by connecting with what we, Lavina read for us in John chapter 11. I want you to imagine with me that you are there during the time of Lazarus. You witnessed him suffer. You witnessed him die. You even witnessed as he was taken to the tomb. And again, you are witnessing the powerful act of salvation, the powerful act of resurrection, sorry, when the Lord Jesus comes and calls him out of the tomb. I want you to imagine being present at that point. Now, before Christ comes to call uh, Lazarus out of the tomb, he was totally dead. Nothing was happening in his life. He could not move. He could not hear. People were mourning. They were doing all sorts of things. They, he could not do anything. He was totally dead. And Paul likens a physical death with a spiritual death in that sense. Just like when one is dead physically, they cannot move, they cannot speak, they cannot do anything, so is the one who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. So the reality, therefore, is that our former status before knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is that we were fully dead spiritually. It is important, therefore, to note that when Paul says they were spiritually dead or they were dead, we need to understand what does he mean? What does he mean by reminding us of uh, this? But before we look at what it means, let's look at what Paul does not mean by saying these people or us before salvation, we were spiritually dead. Paul here does not imply that they were in danger of death. And I want to give an illustration. It might not be a very good one, but I think this will help us to get to uh, understand this. Back at home, we have chicken and dogs. And one of our dogs does not want to look at 
the chicken twice. So if you are not there, he will, she will attack. So what we do to make sure that the chicken are not in danger is we put measures so that this dog does not meet with the chicken at any point. So at night, even when I'm away and I come back, I have to make sure how did they close the door so that he is not, the dog doesn't get there. So we put measures to make sure that the chicken is not in danger. Paul here does not mean that we are in danger of death, of spiritual death rather. What he means is we are totally dead. So if we were in danger, then we will put up measures so that we curb ourselves, so that we prevent ourselves from the danger of this death. But that's not the point of the scriptures. That's not the point that we are looking at here. The point is, we are not in danger of death, but rather we are totally dead. So what does Paul mean then when he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now what Paul means here is that the state in which an individual is before salvation is that they are totally and spiritually dead in that sense. They cannot hear the prompting of the Spirit. They cannot hear and understand the Word of God. Though they are able to read and know what it says, but their heart is not able to comprehend what that says. In other words, they are blinded by sin to the point that they cannot see the grave of sin. Notice Colossians chapter 2 verse 13. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13, Paul again as he writes to the church at Colossae says, Colossians chapter 2 verse 13, and you are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Notice, you are dead in your sins, in your trespasses, but God has made us alive with him in Christ by forgiving us our trespasses. In Luke chapter 15, verse 24, as you read about the story of the prodigal son, the father comes to one point after the son has returned and he says this, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Notice the father knows that the son at the point that he's coming, yes, he's walking, he's alive, but he refers to what happened in his life. As you read that story, we are told that he indulged himself in sin and did everything else that pleased him. But when he came back to his senses, he realized that he has a father who is caring. He realized that he can go back and come and just beg to be allowed to be just a servant because he has sinned against his father. But the father, as we will see of our heavenly father, who is rich in mercy and love, when he saw him, he told the people around him, the servants, for this my son was dead and is alive again. So then what Paul tells us in Ephesians is that when we do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, it simply means that we are spiritually dead. And until the Lord comes and opens our eyes and resurrects us spiritually in that sense, so that we can have life, so that we can know him, so that we can see his goodness in that sense. So Paul does not mean that believers and the saints in Ephesus at this point were in danger of death. What he meant, they were literally dead spiritually. And if they were dead spiritually, they needed the Lord who is able to call Lazarus out of the grave to come to call them out of their deadness and give them a new life. Friends, this death affects all humanity. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, I'll read from verses 9 uh, to 18.
Romans chapter 3 from verse 9, the Bible says, What then are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already changed. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks up for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom, the venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their path are ruin of mystery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Notice what Paul tells us there. No one is righteous. No, not one. No one seeks. No one understands. No one, uh, everyone has turned aside and they have come worthless. No one does good. Not even one. So this death that is spiritual, it affects all humanity. It is for all people. And even for us who are saints this morning, we can celebrate that we were once dead, but today and the time that the Lord saved us, he has called us to a new life. It means, therefore, that there is an expectation that is required of us. So this death, friends, affects all humanity. All people are dead apart from Christ. But notice the implication of the fact that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. A dead person, as I mentioned earlier, cannot do anything. They cannot walk. They cannot speak. They cannot hear. So even when we go to funerals, especially in the villages, you hear the tributes that are given about a dead person. And sometimes you know that these people are not telling the truth. The dead person is not hearing. They are dead. And so is the one who is spiritually dead. And as we go ahead, as we go on, the question I want us to ask ourselves is, are we a partaker of God's grace? Has the light of Christ, has the light of the gospel shown in our hearts that we can say that we were spiritually dead, but today we are alive in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? A dead person cannot do anything. And the question we are asking ourselves then is how can Paul say we are dead, yet we are breathing, yet we are able to eat, yet we are able to walk around? Kent Hage says this, in the area that matters the most, their soul, they have no life. They are blind to the reality, demands, and glory of Christ, and they do not love him. They are as deaf to the Holy Spirit as a corpse. Abba Father has no part in their vocabulary. So one who is spiritually dead do not hear the Spirit of God speaking to them through God's word. One who is spiritually dead cannot understand the fact that we say that the Lord has saved us, has called us, and given us a new life unless the Holy Spirit of God opens his heart, unless God himself moves him and gives him a new life in Christ. But notice the reason for which Paul is telling us that we are spiritually dead. Notice again verse 1, and you are dead in the trespasses and sin. So we were not dead because we lost life, we were physically dead, but we are dead because by nature man is sinful. We are dead not because of Adam's sin. Yes, Adam's sin is the cause of everything else, but we are dead because you and I are sinners just like Adam. We are dead because you and I continue to sin and to disobey our God. And so we cannot hear the promptings of the Holy Spirit unless our heart is changed and opened to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, the, the reason why they 
are in that condition is because of their sins and their trespasses. What marked our past life, therefore, is that we walked in blindness of sin. Notice uh, verse 2. Verse 1 from verse 1. You are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So what Paul tells us then is that, yes, we are sinful. Yes, we are dead in sin. But the reason is because we continue to sin. We continue to live in disobedience. And not only that, we are walking in blindness of sin. To walk in blindness of sin basically means that that is our pattern. That is our lifestyle. That is what we know to do best. We continue to walk in sin. We continue to habitually live a life of sin. That was our status before Christ. But praise be to God that we have a new status in Christ, that we are believers, that we have been adopted, that our sins have been forgiven, that we can trust him and turn to him. Notice what Paul says in verse 2, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Our lifestyle before Christ was marked by a life of sin. But on the contrary, he also tells us in chapter 2 verse 10 that we just read, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So because we were walking in sin, when Christ saved us, then our life changed from a life of walking in sin so that we can do good works. In other words, before salvation, nothing that we ever did was good in the sight of God. In chapter 4, verse 1, he also mentions something. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Notice, we were dead in sins, but when Christ came and saved us, we now can walk worthy of our calling. In chapter 5 again, verse 2, he says, And walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So not only is our life after Christ characterized by good works and characterized by a life worthy of our calling, but it also is called, we are called to walk in love. Again, chapter 5, verse 8, it tells us another way in which we have been called to walk. For at one time you are for at one time you are darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Notice we have been called to walk in the light. And lastly, chapter 5, verse 15, we have been called to walk in wisdom. Chapter 5, verse 15 says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Last week we saw that we have been called, or rather Paul was praying that these believers' eyes might be opened so that they can have spiritual insight, so that they can understand and comprehend the power that God has, that has given us, and that power dwells in us in the Spirit of God. And so the point is, friends, that before Christ, our life was in the pursuit of worldly pleasure. And now we have been called to walk worthy of our calling. Because we are spiritually dead, everything about us was against God. Our love was not for Christ, but for the pleasure of this world. Notice what Apostle John says in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 17. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away. It's passing along with its desires. But whoever, does, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So notice, therefore, as we think of what God has done for us, that he has called us to a life of love, to love him, we are reminded that we must not love the world. We are reminded that we must not love the things of this world. We are reminded that the love of the Father should abide in us so that we can proclaim the goodness of our God. So what is the manner in which um, this has happened? Notice, we were walking in pursuit of worldly pleasure. But secondly, we, are, we were walking deceived by the devil. Notice again verse 2 of Ephesians. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the, of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Notice, the one who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, they have a prince of this world, Satan himself, who controls his life, who influences him to continue a life of, of disobedience to God. So, notice the description. We were following after the ways of Satan. And as you read the scriptures, you're told how God gave him authority and he misused his authority and wanted to get to, to be the one who is in charge. And therefore God chased him away from heaven. And alongside that, he deceived men to disobey God. But not because we disobeyed God, rather, because it was a man's choice. And even as we continue living in this life of Christianity, we still disobey God. But praise be to God that as far as the East is from the West, he has forgiven us our sins. He has called us and adopted us to be his children. Therefore, despite the fact that we are wrong, we can still celebrate that he is good, that he is faithful. When we are unfaithful to him, he continues to be faithful. When we do not understand, he continues to instruct us from his word that we can know him, that we can follow his ways. But before our salvation, we were deceived by the devil. And friends, he still deceives us even now. And so we must walk worthy of our calling. We must saturate our minds with the scriptures so that we can know how to fight his devices. Notice the description of the, the devil in, or Satan in this manner. He is the prince of the power of the air. Not only is he the prince of the power of the air, he is the spirit that influences our disobedience. He is at work. He controls the people so that they can disobey our God. And I pray that now that we know who we are in Christ, that we will continue to forge ahead and when we find ourselves in the wrong, we will run back to God and seek his forgiveness. The Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us all our trespasses when we come to him in repentance. Then he tells us, uh, Paul tells us again, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is, that is now at work, in the sons of disobedience. Now what does Paul mean when he says the sons of disobedience? Here, the sons of disobedience does not mean that we are sons of Satan in that sense. But it means that he is controlling the people and therefore we are like the sons of disobedience, the people who do not obey God, the people who refuse to listen to what God is saying, the people who are not listening or living a lifestyle of disobedience. These are the sons of disobedience in that sense. He will later tell us that we should not be like them. We should not live in disobedience like these people because now the light of Christ has shone in our hearts. Now we know what sin is. Now we know the consequences of sin. But the one who do not know the Father, 
does not know the consequence of sin. They live in that sin. They continue to indulge themselves in sin. Until they come to their senses like that prodigal son, only then will they start to realize that our life before Christ was not a good life. Only then can they turn to the Lord in salvation. And so what we've seen in verses 1 and 2 is the reality of our former status, that we were spiritually dead and totally dead in that sense. But notice verse 3, the result of our former status. Let me just pick it up from verse 1 so that we get uh, the point well. And you are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the, uh, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Notice then the result of our former status, the result that is brought by a life that is marked of walking and following after the course of the plans of the evil, evil one, or walking and indulging ourselves in sin. Paul tells us that one, they became disobedient to God, but secondly, they became children of wrath. In other words, they displeased God and therefore the wrath of God is all that they deserved. And thank God that we did not see that wrath of God. When he saves us, he changes our lives completely. That we are not now children of wrath, but children who are living to the praise of his glorious name. Children that are hopeful that as we look forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we will reign with him, that we will live with him, that he will give us eternal life, that which he has promised to his uh, to his children. And so the result, therefore, one, is that we became disobedient because we chose to sin against our God. But secondly, we became, by nature, children of wrath. Notice what Paul tells us in verse 3, among whom all, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. So if you are a believer this morning, at one point, you are a children of wrath, a child of wrath, sorry. You are a disobedient child. You are one who did not obey God, who did not follow after his ways, who did not listen to the Spirit's prompting. But praise be to God that he gave you a new life in him. He gave you a new name. He gave you a new nature. And therefore now you are called a child of God. You are no longer children of wrath but you are waiting for the coming of the Lord so that you can rejoice. Friend, this that does not mean that while we are believers, we don't go through circumstances. This does not mean that while we are believers, we don't entangle ourselves into sin. What it means is that we no longer now live as people who are hopeless, but we are living our lives hoping that we are forgiven. We are living our life hoping that when Christ comes, we will be with him that we will be exalted, that finally there will be a day that we will conquer sin once and for all. But in the meantime, we are called to do what John calls us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. When we find ourselves in sin, we run to him because he's a merciful father as we are going to see in a bit. We run to him because he's able and he will forgive us our sins. So all of us lived this lifestyle. We were motivated by the passions of our flesh. We were giving in to the pursuit of the same. We allowed our flesh to control us and therefore lead us into decision that we make. Friends, we did not please God, but we were pleasing ourselves. In fact, Paul says we were like them. Let me read verse 3 again among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So mankind is sinful by nature until the Lord himself shines the light of the gospel in their hearts. And so if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, 
you are sinful. And what Paul tells us this morning is that you are dead spiritually. But praise be to God that you cannot remain in that state when you hear the gospel. Because it's the gospel is the power of God to salvation. He is able to save us. He is able to save you. He is able to save all that will come to the Lord in salvation. And so Paul tells us we were like those people who do not know God. Imagine your friend that you know for sure do not know the Lord. Your relatives that for sure you know they do not know the Lord. You can watch their lives. You can see how they live their lives. And their lives perhaps is not admirable. But you can proclaim Christ to these people. And Christ can raise them from their deadness and bring them to life in Christ. And so this, is, this was our former status. We were like them. And therefore, in reference to those that are sinful, in reference to those who continue to live a life of habitual uh, disobedience to God, to people who do not listen to the Spirit of God. Our status before Christ is that we were dead. But notice, before tell, Paul transitions and tells us our next status, or our present status in Christ, he pauses to use verse 4 to tell us who God is so that we can appreciate what he has done. Because if we just run from the point that we were dead in sin and now we are alive in Christ and we don't see who God is and what he has played in making us from being dead to being alive in Christ, this point will not make sense to us. And so Paul pauses and tells us who God is. Notice verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us. And then he will continue in verse 5 to tell us what he has done in that. So notice, we were totally dead in sin. There was nothing good that we could do. We did not pursue anything that is righteous. We did not seek after God. We were seeking after our own desires, after our own pleasures, so that we can fulfill the pleasures of our lives and our, of our bodies. Then Paul tells us, but God, the word but gives a contrast. This is who you are. But then he tells us, God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he has for mankind, he saved us. No wonder we can say it is all by his grace. Because if it was all by something that I can do, then I will have a reason, as we will see in the next portion, to boast about my salvation, about your salvation, about our salvation. Because you know what? We have attained it. We've worked for it. We rightfully own it. But what Paul tells us is that when it comes to salvation, it is nothing that man does. It, is, it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your intellect. It has nothing to do with your background. It has nothing to do with your knowledge. It is all about God. And so he says, we were dead in sins, but God, who is rich in mercy, shone the light of the gospel on our hearts so that we can know him. Notice two things that we, we see in verses 4 about God. One, he is merciful. Secondly, he is loving. So let's look at his mercy, first of all, before we look at his, his love. Notice, we were all dead in sin and trespasses. Therefore, the only, our only hope is in the fact that because of God's mercy, Christ came. Because of God's mercy, Christ suffered. Because of God's mercy, Christ was resurrected. And therefore, we can see the victory that we have in Christ because God is merciful. The word mercy means kindness, compassionate. So we were dead in sin. We do not deserve his, his, his goodness. All we deserved were his wrath. But then because he's kind, because he's merciful, because he has compassion on us, he sent the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice the description for his mercy. He's not just saying God is merciful. Notice, but God being rich in mercy. He is rich in mercy. 
In other words, he's not lacking compassion. He is rich in compassion. He has it all, and therefore he shines his mercy upon us by saving us, even though we do not deserve his, his goodness. Psalms, verse 103, from verses 8 to 11 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgression from us. As far as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Friends, I want to pause there and ask us this question. Do you fear the Lord? Do you fear the Lord that you can receive his abundant mercy? Do you fear him to the point that you can see his love that is uh, abounding, that is steadfast on us? Can we say at the bottom of our hearts, as we examine our lives, that we are forgiven? That our sins, past, present, and future, are already taken care of in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What is your hope this morning? My hope as an individual is that I hope in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my sins, as far as the East is from the West, are forgiven. And therefore I can rejoice that though I live in this sinful world, I will see the Father. Though I live in this sinful world, he would call me home. So, the Lord is merciful. Secondly, the Lord is loving. Again, notice the description of his love, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love. So his love is great. His love is beyond our imagination. He does not love with strings attached. Because after all, he saved us. The saving was his doing, not our doing. So we cannot say that because we did well, so we were saved, and therefore God loves us because we did that. No, he loves us before even we loved him. Friends, this love that God has for his saints, for his children, is great. He loved us first before we loved him. First John uh, chapter 4 says, let me pick it up from verse 7 to verse 10. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is made perfect in us. Friends, as we think of who God is, that he is rich in mercy, and he's given us the mercy that he has. He has given us the blessings that we need in Christ Jesus. We can only hope in the fact that our God is loving. In the fact that I don't deserve his goodness. In the fact that you don't deserve his goodness. Yet he loves us. And all the way, all the same, he loves us and has given us this goodness. This should call us to praise him. So our former status is that we were dead in sins but God who is rich in grace, in mercy and the God who is great in love has sent us and given us a new name, a new status. And so verse 5 then uh, introduces uh, the sentence the place where verse 5 comes in will only make sense if we go up to verse 7. But again because of the richness of this text I will stop only on verse 5 and allow uh, us to come back and study in depth. 
but also that gives you a time to go and read along this passage so that you understand as you prepare for the next sermon that will be coming. But notice verse 5. Let me read it from verse 4. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ, by grace you have been saved. Notice our present status in Christ Jesus. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, his love and mercy has granted us a new life, a new beginning, a new reason for life, and a new hope, even as we look to him. Notice what Paul tells us. We have been made alive in Christ. Friends, being made alive here is passive. In the sense that it is not us who makes ourselves alive. Somebody must make us alive. Take again the example of Lazarus in the tomb. He did not just walk out, but Christ called him out so that he was able to walk out. And that is exactly what Paul reminds us this morning, that our present status is something that God has worked out so that we can now, who are dead in sins, can now be alive in Christ and therefore know that we can live a righteous life, though we are sinful, though we live in this sinful world, because he has made us alive. It is only God who can give spiritual life to the spiritually dead. By this act, we have been given a reason to hope for a better life ahead of us, even as we look to him. We can now do what Paul calls us in verse chapter 1, to praise him, to rejoice in what he has done, because he has saved us, he has given us a new life. Again, let me ask, are you a partaker of this new life? Has your life changed? Is this true of you? Can you turn to him in praise knowing that you are a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, the door is not closed. The room is open. The Lord is able to save you just like he saved some of us who are here this morning. But notice the means by which we attained our present status. Notice verse 5 again, even as I, I come to the end. Let me pick it up from verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So the means by which we have attained a new status in Christ is all by grace. It is not our doing. It is not what we can do. It is all by the grace of God. And so friends, I'm calling you this morning to behold, to see the grace of God. The grace that has turned you from a child of wrath to a child who is waiting and hoping for the inheritance that only can be given by the Lord himself. The grace of God here is God's favor upon us who wronged him. We rebelled, yet he has looked at us with mercy. He has embraced us and adopted us as his sons and, as his, and welcomed us into his family that we can identify ourselves with Christ. We are no longer therefore, friends, his enemies, but his children. And again, even as we do I look at our application this morning. Are you a child of God? In chapter 1, as we think of what Paul has done, he has called us to rejoice and praise God for our salvation. He has called us to be grateful for the spiritual insight and wisdom and the spiritual blessings that the Lord has given us. And he is reminding us that knowing how he has changed our lives, we should, it should cause us to continue rejoicing, to continue praising him, to continue being grateful for what he has done. This morning again, he has come back to remind us of exactly what he's been talking about in verse chapter 1. He's reminded us of where the Lord has brought us from and now telling us, or rather displaying to us what God has done in our salvation. 
Friend, this should help us do five things. Knowing the truth that we were sin dead in our sins, but because of the grace of God, we are now alive in him, should call us and encourage us to live our lives with hope. That the Lord is great, that though things are not working our way in some points, that though we are going through circumstances, we can hope in the fact that this God who is rich in mercy, who is great in love, has called us and called us his sons. Are you hopeful this morning? Secondly, not only are we encouraged to be hopeful, we are encouraged to trust him so that he might lead us by his grace. It is by the grace of God that we have been saved. Again, it is by the grace of God that we will be sustained in this salvation. If you go back to the series that we looked at in First Peter, Peter called us and reminded us that the Lord who has saved us continually guard us in that salvation, waiting to present us before the Father. So we can trust him, that even though things might not be going our ways, he is faithful. He's not going to change his mind. He is not going, he's not going to think like, I saved this person and now he's too sinful, I am going to abandon him. That's not how God works. That is how you and I works. But for our God, he is faithful. We can trust him to lead us by his grace. Thirdly, we can depend on his power, that that power dwells in us in the person of the Spirit. We can depend in his word that the power of God that is unto salvation is in his word, and therefore he will lead us even as we live this life. But fourthly, the truth of what God has done for us should compel us to make this God known. It should compel us to constantly do good, to constantly walk in love, to constantly encourage others to come to know him. Notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verse 1 to 6. Therefore, having this mystery by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to temper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we will commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Notice what he says in verse 3. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. If in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as the Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine on the darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So our hope as we proclaim Christ, as we make him known, is that the Lord who has shown this light in our own hearts will be able to radiate that light into the hearts of those that are perishing, into the hearts that, of those that do not know Christ. The last application that we look at this morning is that if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, I'd like you to realize that you are dead in your sins. And because you are dead in your sins, you are blind as well. And only God can give you life and life eternal. So let me encourage you to come to him. Let me encourage you to talk to one of our brothers and sisters here that you feel comfortable with and seek the grace of God. Again, as I conclude, think of Lazarus in that womb. Think of the stillness in fact, they tell Christ when he asked them to open, please do not open because he might be stinking. He's been there for four days. During those days, there were no formalin that people used to treat the dead body or the medications that they use. When one is dead, they are taken that way, the way they are. No injection. And so the body will decompose fast. They will smell very fast. 
But the Lord is saying to them, open, and he calls Lazarus because he's the Lord of the resurrection. He is the life and the resurrection. We can trust him that he can turn our lives from being children of wrath to rejoicing in the fact that he is God, to rejoicing in the fact that he has saved us and to give him and to live a life that glorifies him. This is exactly what we see in this passage. We were dead in our sins and trespasses, but God, rich in mercy and love, has raised us up to a new life. Friends, this truth should cause us to be grateful. No wonder Paul calls us in verse chapter 1 to be grateful, to be thankful for the wisdom and the insight that we have. Remember, you are dead in sin. And again, remember, the glorious truth is that you are alive in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that this will cause us to worship him more, that this will cause us to love him more, because he's done so much for us. I mean, in our reflection question that I think is on our bulletin, are you a partaker of this grace? Does your manner of life reflect your present status? If you say that you are a Christian, can that be watched? Can that be seen? Or are you one who is a stumbling block to your fellow brethren? And most importantly, a stumbling block to those that are perishing because they don't want to be like you. I pray that our lives will match our proclamation. That as we say that we are believers, that as we say that he has raised us from the dead, as we say that we are near, uh, alive in him, that will match with what we do day to day. That as we go out of this place today and through the rest of the week, people will see God and see Christ in your life. May that be true of you and may that be true of me. Amen? Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for what you have done in saving us. We thank you that we were lost in our sinfulness. But this morning we are rejoicing, even with the saints at Ephesus, that we have been made alive in Christ. Lord, thank you for this grace that has saved us. Thank you for this grace that continue to keep us in this salvation. As we look to your coming, as we wait upon you, how we pray that, Lord, you will make our lives worthy of the gospel that we proclaim, that we will be different with the people that do not know you, that our lives will be a gospel on its own. We thank you that you have saved us. We thank you that you've reminded us of this truth. Help us, Lord, that this week we can shine the light of Christ, that we can continue without fear that you are unveiling the truth in the hearts of those who have lived as sons of disobedience and that, Lord, you will draw them to your son. And so bless us and guide us even as we think about this. As we examine our lives and our daily walk, our conversations, our mannerism of life, may we live to the praise of your glorious name because of what you have done for us. Lord, we thank you for doing so much for us. We thank you for saving us. And we can only say that you are a good God. You are gracious. Thank you for helping us to see your grace, to behold this grace. Now help us, Lord, to live by this grace and to move, focusing and trusting in your leading. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.